Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis, and I want to review how we have been doing with our new approach to intubation and airway management. Now, as I mentioned when we rolled out the new protocols, the measure of our success would be how we did on the NIMSQA Airway 01 performance measure. Now, this is intubation first pass success without hypoxia or hypotension, and it's also called DASH 1A. I'd like to share the first six months of results and then compare them to a little over a year or so of results prior to implementing the protocol. This comes from a formal analysis we've been doing, and we are absolutely going to publish this so that other systems can learn from what we've done here. I'm also going to review the key things we've learned, and I'm going to share several tips and reminders about what we need to do to continue to improve. And most importantly, I want us to remember why we are doing this. It is to improve the care we provide for our patients. As I say all the time, it's about them. It's not about us. Now, Dash 1A is calculated among all patients not in cardiac arrest who undergo endotracheal intubation. That's the denominator or the number at the bottom of the ratio. The numerator or that top number is the number of those patients who have a first pass success and have at least one value for SpO2 and for SBP in the five minutes before and after the first attempt, and no SpO2 values less than 90, or no SBP values less than 90, either before or after. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of pieces that have to work well to get this. This is a hard measure. And the other thing I want you all to notice is that this measure is not identical to our protocol. We adopted the national measure to allow us to benchmark against national performance. And I'm going to give you a little bit of that in a bit. Our protocol is more stringent, erring on the side of patient safety. Okay, so what did we find? Overall, we're looking at 397 patients in total. 283 of those are in the old group and 114 in the new protocol group. The bottom line results are our first pass success moved from 59% to 82%, and our DASH 1A increased from 27% to 60, more than doubled. Both of these increases were statistically significant, and obviously they're clinically significant. I used something called logistic regression, which I'm now going to take the next hour and a half to explain in great detail with lots of math and equations. Or I could just say that this is a way of controlling for other things that can impact a dash 1A and leave it at that. In this case, we controlled for age and gender and the initial vital signs. And we're looking at an odds ratio for the association between using this new protocol and dash 1A. And what we found is a 40% increase in the odds of dash 1A with the new protocol. That's an adjusted rate almost twice that of when we were using it before. Now, for context, the national benchmark on this measure is a little bit under 30%. It's roughly where we started from. The highest value that I've seen for this in the literature was 80%, and that was in a dedicated critical care transport system. Of the agencies that in implement improvement efforts, most of them are in the upper 50s to mid 60s, right around where we are. Now, I am pleased with this improvement. I really am. I think we're doing a great job, but I want to make sure that we continue to improve. After all, we owe it to our patients to be as safe as we possibly can. Now, with that in mind, let's quickly review the reasons for fallouts where we didn't achieve Dash 1A success. The most common reason was missed intubation and hypotension. Both of those accounted for 35% of failures. Total, 70% of our failures were either from missed intubation or hypotension. Next up was hypoxia. The vast majority of that was after the intubation. So about that hypotension. 
Remember that in order to pass the measure, we had to both have a recorded value in the peri-intubation period and no values below the threshold. Let's see, what does that mean? A means a good way to fail the measure is not having a blood pressure in the five minutes before and five minutes after. As it turns out of the 35% of failures for hypotension, about half of those were because we didn't take a blood pressure when we should. Of these, when we ask the crews about it, we learn they forgot to change the monitor to Q2 vital signs. If they had, vast majority of these would have passed if only we had followed that part of the checklist that clearly says switch the monitor to Q2 vital signs. Now, Dash 1A only measures those patients who get rocuronium and go on to get an intubation. It doesn't look at those we've had a bailout on. What we've seen as we're looking at those is about 14% of patients who get rocuronium and then rapidly desaturate. And that forces us to bail out and place a superglottic. And we're still looking at these to learn as much as we can from them, but so far we're seeing several common issues that we can improve on. There's nothing in this list that I'm about to tell you here that is new. Everything is a function of ex execution on what y'all already know how to do. I'd like to give you five things that we can do to improve these fallouts and make intubation safer for our patients. Dr. Miller has put together a flyer reminding us of these five things, and we're going to be sending these around um, the system. Please, guys, please notice the beautiful maroon coloring. Nice job, Brian. Gig em, my friend. All right. The number one tip, number one tip for hitting dash 1A is set the monitor to take blood pressures every two minutes. There's really no excuse for not doing it. Just take a BP every two minutes, switch it, the machine does it for you. It's both in the protocol and the checklist. Which actually brings me to tip number two, use the checklist. Run through all of the items on the checklist after you have achieved your goal saturation, your goal blood pressures, and just before you give the rock. It is a final check to make sure you have everything in place before you fully commit to this airway, before you take their ability to maintain their airway. All right, use the checklist. Number three, use airway adjuncts. We have seen lots of cases where we're just not using NPAs and patients desaturate. If the patient will tolerate it, use an OPA also. I think something important to understand about airway management is that a patient with muscle tone who can protect their own airway, even if they're not breathing adequately, those folks are a lot easier to get by with poor mask ventilation technique. You can effectively manage an awful lot of airways without NPAs, without good positioning, without all of the things that we ask you to do, right up until we take away the muscle tone that is keeping the tongue and other dependent structures out of the way. Once those paralytics kick in, you lose that tone and often the airway closes up and gets way more difficult to manage. And when I say the airway closes up, I don't mean the vocal cords close, I mean the tongue falls back, their airway slouches down. This is the reason you need to be prepared to manage that airway and do it well. All of the components of Max BVM are specifically built to help you do this, use them. And please understand there is nothing basic about mask ventilation. It is one of the harder psychomotor skills we do. Please pay attention to it. You can use the waveform in tidal CO2 to see if you're getting effective tidal ventilation. If you're not, change something. All right, what kind of things can we change? Let's switch to tip number four. Use a two-handed mask seal using your fingers to lift the mandible up into the mask and open the airway instead of pushing the mask down and occluding the airway. Lift, don't 
push. Just assume that mask ventilation of a paralyzed patient is going to be harder than you think it is, and it's going to be way harder than the patient was to ventilate before they became paralyzed. All right, tip number five is use PEEP of at least five millimeters of mercury to improve your oxygenation and maintain it. Now, you should have been using this all along to maximize your pre-oxygenation. Make sure you're using it. Make sure you're actually looking at the little valve to make sure that it is turned in a little bit. Again, PEEP, not optional, mandatory for this. All right, those are five tips that cover the vast, vast majority of Dash 1A failures that we've seen. All right, sorry, y'all. I lied. There are more. Each is also a key component of max BVM. Number six, elevate the patient's head. This improves both oxygenation and intubation success, and it prolongs the safe apneic period, just like the literature reviewed told us. All right, tip number seven is use nasal cannula oxygenation at flesh rates. Don't forget apneic oxygenation. Okay, so seven and two... Seven, seven tips, seven tips for success, seven things that are so important to improve airway safety that we made them mandatory. And to help us not forget them, they're written down in both the protocol and the checklist. Now, the other big reason for failure is that we just missed the tube. This is hard. It's hard to get these tubes. And one thing that we're going to be working on improving coming up quickly is how we go about intubating. We're launching a trial, much like we did for the IGEL or the AirQ, but this time to look at the impact of a hyperacute angled channeled blade. I'm a huge fan of these, but we need to prove that they work in this system. More on that to come. Last thing I want to tell you is I am very proud of the improvement we've made in airway management. We made this improvement because of the amazing work y'all have been doing. I am incredibly proud of that work, and I am incredibly proud of y'all. I think we all collectively should be proud of this because I want you to understand you are truly blazing a trail for all other EMS systems to follow. This is the basis, this is the foundation for a national airway improvement campaign that we are part of. We are truly setting the standard here in Fort Worth. So I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the improvement, but I know we can always get better. We have to always continue to try to get better. That's really the point of this video. Guys, thank you all for what you do every day. As always, please reach out with any questions, comments, concerns. I love hearing from you all. Take care, y'all.